Yesterday, we worked our tails off. I was dog tired at the end of the day. I hope you were as well. It was a lot of fun, but please, as Doug said, give us feedback. Um, now I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Don Lanza from Florida, who is one of the most entertaining, fun, energetic speakers I know, and I have been wanting to get him out to Seattle for a long time. So Don, thank you for flying up. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so uh, again, I have limited time with lots of information to share. Uh, this is um, year 24 since I finished uh, my fellowship training. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, two people that meant uh, an enormous, uh, still mean an enormous amount to me, uh, Loring Pratt and David Kennedy. I learned uh, a lot from both of them. And uh, some of what you hear and see is related to my relationships and learning from both of them. So I had to assign myself some CME objectives for you to learn, and that uh, one of the things that I was early on acknowledged for was uh, being a turbinate preservationist. Uh, and I consider myself still a turbinate preservationist, but I think a limited middle turbinate trim can be a very good thing for the patient experience as well as for the surgeon's experience. Um, something that nobody's talking about, which I think is important uh, for you to be aware of clinically, and if you don't think about it, you'll never see it. It's a condition that has an ICD-9 code, chronic nasopharyngitis. Uh, in children, you know, we know of it as adenoiditis, uh, but when there's no adenoids, uh, there still can be an infection in the nasopharynx. Uh, become uh, familiar with the goals and indications for sinus surgery as I perceive them for chronic rhinosinusitis. So those are the objectives. But there are some additional things uh, that uh, are really core here. All chronic rhinosinusitis is not the same. It may require a continuous treatment. And uh, acknowledging that helps us with our patients so that they have realistic expectations. Recurring acute chronic recurring acute rhinosinusitis has several causes of which chronic nasopharyngitis uh, may be mistaken for recurring acute rhinosinusitis. Um, silent extraesophageal reflux is perhaps related. Um, for a long time, uh, we, uh, we taught, I was taught, that rigid endoscopy was so superior to flexible nasal endoscopy. They're complementary, and um, uh, in fact, most of our patients experience dual endoscopy at their initial office evaluation if they've had previous surgery. Otherwise, a flexible scope is used for most of the endoscopy. Um, organisms are an important part of sinus inflammation, and there's uh, topical therapy really has value. Uh, for a long time, uh, long before I was uh, even a resident, uh, there was an adage, the solution to pollution is dilution, uh, so that there's some benefit to washing away some of the problems inside the sinuses. Uh, for procedures, you want to preserve muco mucosa and remember Newton, which I talked about yesterday, that you should start at the most inferior and posterior portion of the dissection or surgery that you can practically start at uh, so that you shouldn't do a frontal before you do a sphenoid. You shouldn't do an anterior ethmoid high before you do a sphenoid. Uh, you may need to do some maxillary or low ethmoid work to get to the sphenoid adequately, but remember gravity, particularly in revision surgery. So those are the critical points. We want to think about the etiology of rhinosinusitis. It has many uh, host factors, uh, including inhalant allergy, um, um, immodal cilia, syndrome, cystic fibrosis, uh, and anatomic features, systemic disease, neuromechanisms, neoplasms, GERD, LPR, and environmental uh, issues, uh, including noxious chemicals, microbes, trauma. Um, we know that polyps can be different, some of them neutrophilic, some of them eosinophilic, and that uh, immodal cilia syndrome, uh, as we heard yesterday, for CF patients may be best managed uh, by creating gravity-dependent drainage. And that not all sinusitis is really uh, what you think, uh, this patient masqueraded as sinusitis for some time before the diagnosis of Wegener's could be made, and the actual fact 
it, the diagnosis went from chronic sinusitis uh, associated with a tooth to fungus to cancer to Wegener's. It was that hard to assess. <laughs> you would think it would not be the case. Um, so uh, you want to keep these inflammatory, other inflammatory conditions in mind when you're trying to figure out which type of sinusitis you're managing. Uh, this is uh, how rhinosporidiosis might appear. Um, this patient was diagnosed at a Ivy League institution in the far northeast, not at Penn, uh, with um, nasal polyps um, uh, by their histopathologists. And um, interestingly, this patient is still alive. This was November 2011, and he recently went to a wedding and traveled. So even though it looks devastating, and he is devastated, uh, he has quality of life from November of 2011 until um, March of 2015. I just saw him the other day. Um, so that surgery can uh, give some benefit with follow-up radiation in a surprising, amazing way. He's living with disease. Um, remember, maximal medical therapy for chronic rhinosinusitis can include a bucket of stuff. Uh, steroids are the mainstay, uh, antimicrobials, uh, nasal lavage, antihistamines, leukotriene modifiers, surgery, uh, anti-IgE in the form of Zolair, and investigational, but should be through with uh, phase three trials sometimes uh, soon, is a monoclonal antibody to IL-5, um, gamma globulins, immunotherapy, uh, mucolytics, uh, decongestants, anti-reflux measures, smoking cessation, all parts of medical management for sinusitis. Uh, Greg, what I don't know is my clock. Uh, so I know I have a keynote thing, but I can you know, go on for hours with the podium. Uh, there, my, there is my clock, thank you, I uh, appreciate that. All right, uh, all chronic sinusitis is not the same. You might wanna ask yourself multiple questions when you're evaluating the patient. Is there a predominant microorganism? Is there tissue involvement by the organism? Is there IgE-mediated disease? Are leukotrienes associated with the inflammation? Is there an adaptive immunity dysfunction? Is there an innate immunity dysfunction with things like mannose binding lectin deficiencies or complement deficiencies? Is there occult extraesophageal reflux? Um, we know how disease can look um, in a variety of different ways, fungus, uh, has its own appearance where you can find hyperdensities. This is a case presentation, um, and I see it as very important to engage you on the importance of medical therapy. Many people have moved more towards understanding medical therapy over the past two decades and how important it is, and surgery didn't work. Well, it doesn't cure the problem because it's a chronic disorder, but this is a patient who had polyps coming from the front of his nose. And this CAT scan is uh, done at an outside facility maybe uh, uh, three weeks before I met the patient or a month or so. And he was scheduled for surgery in a week. He's quite frightened by the surgery. His uh, rest of his scan looks like this. Uh, on this imaging, you might see, if you look where I'm pointing on the screen, uh, some changes in mucosal density from here to here. This actually could be hyperdensity along with a uh, possibility of fungus being present or just long-standing pus. Um, but you get the idea that he's completely impacted by his disease and he desperately doesn't want to have surgery. Please also note that a lot of the lamellae that you're used to look sort of widened and maybe absent inside the nose by the long-standing nature of his disease. His Leading symptoms is nasal blockage and loss of sense of smell. He denies facial pressure. As long as treatment by other otolaryngologists in 2005 was 10 days of antibiotics and uh, med medrol dose packs, that's what, what he received, which is really uh, insufficient and uh, enabling for surgery. Uh, the patient has known inhalant allergy to mold and dust mite um, but he's an air-conditioned repairman in Florida. He's around mold all the time. So he's got a job hazard. There's no way that he's not going to have a problem. He's got problems uh, with uh, asthma, 
uh, particularly when his sinusitis is flared. He has no aspirin sensitivity. His eosinophil count at the time of the CT was normal, and he tried allergy shots. They didn't work, as if somebody promoted that that would fix what he had. Um, you see the extent of the disease. Again, this is from December 27th. I think I saw him the first last week in January uh, 2006. Uh, so I started him on a Medrol taper, uh, basically 0 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight or 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight of prednisone, the equivalent of it. Put him on, uh, I'm sorry, these are brand names. I'll tell you that they're generic. I have no commercial relationship with anybody. That's Montelukast, Fexofenadine, Amoxicillin, Clavulinate. Uh, I did aspirate some purulent material amidst the polyps. Within a few days, the culture came back positive for Pseudomonas. He was switched over from amoxicillin uh, to Cipro and uh, um, had the steroid taper, which lasted almost three weeks, about 21 days. So uh, the patient returns on his second appointment uh, 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 almost a month later, describing a miracle has occurred. He can smell intermittently, and he tolerated the medicines well. The exam looks much better than I expected. Uh, he repeated another two-week course of Cipro, restarted uh, methylprednisolone uh, taper, uh, and returned four weeks with a CAT scan. This is what he looked like at the CAT scan. It looks like he may have had surgery in his ethmoid, but he's never had surgery. This is what he decided to live with for his quality of life. And this is his endoscopy on the day of his return appointment. Clearly, there are obstructive polyps of the middle meatus, and when he comes off of the benefit of systemic steroid or any of the medical therapy, those polyps are going to be a source of secondary obstruction once again. So I advised him that surgery was certainly appropriate, but it would be a much easier surgery in general, what needs to be done to try and open the sinuses and help him get healed. <laughs> he uh, had a scan uh, again, uh, which I don't subscribe to at this point. Uh, we used to get scans much more frequently than we do now. It's very clear that there's a higher incidence of brain tumors in children who receive the, over a certain threshold of, I think, five scans or six scans before uh, their middle teen years. Uh, the, so you want to limit the scans and keep radiation down. But I had this objective evaluation at that time and you can get an idea how well he is. I talked to him more about surgery. He never returned. However, only in the last four months, he tried to reschedule an appointment with me. So I don't know what's going on. I'd like to give you long-term follow-up on how he did, but there's something miraculous about medical therapy in this setting, which uh, should not be ignored. Um, and he tolerated the therapy well. That's a key. So um, I, I think that there's often an infection of worsening of the biofilm <coughs> uh, associated with the mucosal surfaces. Noam Cohen, who is an associate professor at Penn, uh, doing some careful microbiome research, uh, has argued do, to those who are opposed to the concept of infection and sinus inflammation, do you think that purulence would be present and the inflammation would be as acute if bacteria or organisms were not present on the lining of an inflamed sinus? If it was basically a sterile environment, would there be the motivation for the intensity of the inflammation? We all agree that chronic, chronic rhinosinusitis is not cured by antibiotics alone. That's not the whole thing. But ignoring the organisms uh, doesn't make sense at this point in time. So you want to turn off the inflammatory cascade, restore mucociliary clearance. Patients with chronic rhinosinusitis are clearly an unreliable gauge of their own disease. You want to screen for inhalant allergy. Before surgery, there was a physician uh, in uh, uh, northeastern United States who was actually uh, incarcerated uh, for losing suspiciously preoperative CAT scans in time for trial. But one of the allegations was that he was uh, treating for allergy only after he operated uh, to have disease, uh, suggesting there were abuses in his practice that other 
physicians in the state acknowledged, um, and um, he uh, has since been released from jail. Anyway, uh, culture-directed antibiotic therapy is best. Systemic steroids make a difference, and remember prophylaxis of uh, flu vaccine. Regarding what we do with surgery, um, we think about uh, surgery as being, uh, you know, you're cutting out polyps, uh, but we don't really think a surgery is like an anti-inflammatory therapy. But in a way, it is. Because in polypoid chronic rhinosinusitis, there is a high concentration of uh, leukotrienes circulating in the body, which have been shown to decrease after surgery. Uh, urinary systemal leukotrienes drop down dramatically in patients who are aspirin-sensitive polyposis and in non-aspirin-sensitive polyposis after the surgery, suggesting there's a reduction in overall inflammatory mediators circulating in the bloodstream, and that the surgery has that benefit by debulking a body of the, the reservoir of the leukotrienes. Regarding recurrent acute rhinosinusitis, there are several papers in the literature for some very prominent individuals talking about it as a, uh, a specific disease entity, um, but not really taking into account the etiology. Um, and uh, it's really something that I used to operate on and used to actually enjoy the surgery because you'd operate when they were well and the anatomy was clear and you really helped them uh, with how they felt. Um, except uh, it, it's uh, not necessary most of the time. You know, they're exposed to frequent viral infections. Um, they have uh, people who are uh, frequent air travelers, uh, handshaking without hand washing. Uh, frequent exposure to infected individuals. These are high-risk people, and if they can change some of their health habits, the problem can go away. Uh, you know, there are families where kids and parents kiss on the mouth, and they share spoons and little drinks for little kids who go to daycare. What are we thinking? I mean, I don't get it. Uh, so um, it, it, there's some new data about how much, uh, or how many organisms are exchanged in a kiss. I'm not opposed to kissing, but uh, you know, the general idea is that there's a germ swap that's going on with that kind of contact. Uh, naturally occurring and surgically created uh, recirculation are potential issues. Recurring exposure to some irritants or allergens, immune dysfunction, and uh, uh, combined uh, variable immune deficiency, innate immune dysfunction, all of these can be associated with recurring acute rhinosinusitis. But it can also be misdiagnosed chronic rhinosinusitis where patients go into quiescent stage and they think they're completely well in between it. But if you're not scanning them and trying to figure out if they have remaining disease, you don't know that. Um, so you want to do an appropriate workout. A workup. This is an appearance of naturally occurring maxillary sinus recirculation, uh, and this is a surgically occurring maxillary sinus recirculation in a left middle meatus. Um, there, so there are these conditions that may mimic or trigger recurrent acute, which I've mentioned, chronic rhinosinusitis, GERD and LPR, headache or facial pain can masquerade as sinusitis. Uh, patients who have migraine get nasal congestion. Bam, I got that infection again. And they're having cyclical migraine. Uh, and they're the most difficult patient to convince that this is not the migraine that knocks them down in bed with lights out uh, and uh, nausea and vomiting, but it's a different form of migraine, a chronic migraine. Uh, and they are so insistent and uh, actually passionate about telling you, no, this is different than my migraine headaches. And they, they talk to us as physicians like we're idiots. Uh, because they know their body. They're in touch with their body. Um, it's a challenge. So this is how chronic nasopharyngitis uh, appears. Uh, recently, we submitted it to the Rhinologic Society just to get the word out. Uh, we were accepted as a poster. We've declined. We think uh, that this thing, which is a very little thing, um, uh, is uh, not uh, being addressed in the literature. There's only one publication that we find out of New Zealand on the pus that's present isolated in the nasopharynx with normal CT scan exams. 
In fact, there's a patient who came to me from a prestigious institution in the southern United States above the Florida border where the patient had a CAT scan demonstrating a crust sitting in the nasopharynx, and she was insistent that she had recurring acute rhinosinusitis, but when the doctors look inside the nose at this fellowship-trained rhinology center, they saw no sinusitis, but she knew she was getting pus, and it was this debris that was dropping down from the nasopharynx into the back of the throat that she uh, was not able to convey to them. And asking the patient, are you snorting this in? Are you blowing this out? Are you coughing it up? And you know, there's the, <coughs> are you coughing? Are you, <coughs> are you expectorating? Are you <coughs> snorting? Are you blowing? Which of those noises? And those noises actually will help instruct you, teach the patient the difference between what the drainage is because these are unsettling conversations for some patients to have with you because it's disgusting. They don't want to talk about it or express it to you. This is a patient who is a medical student uh, at uh, USF. When she was a high school student, I began to take care of her in St. Pete. She went, uh, uh, had surgery and this pathologist called me and said, hey, Don, what's going on with this gal? I said, well, what do you mean? He said, there's partly digested food in this sinus content you're sending me. Why is that? So she's sort of like a debutante kind of gal. And I think, oh my gosh, she's bulimic. So I'm discussing this with her family and I'm having this delicate conversation and all of this stuff. She denies it. She goes away to a prestigious institution in the South. Uh, all right, it was Duke. Uh, I send her to UNC because I like the rhinologist at UNC better, a good friend, uh, Brent Sr. He operates on her again. He finds partly digested food in her stomach, in her sinuses, in the pathology. What the heck? So she's denying bulimia. So I said, you know, I've told you for a long time, I think it could be reflux. I'm not really sure. This would be really unusual. No, oh, uh, all right. So she goes to the prestigious Duke Gastroenterology. Nobody's from Duke here. Anyway, oh, oh sorry. I'm not, I'm not. All right. So uh, the gastroenterologists say, oh, all those ENT guys think this, this reflux thing is, it's, you don't have reflux. I'm competing with Duke gastroenterologists. There's the experts on reflux. And they say, so I said to her, I said, did they read the pathology report? She said, well, I gave them all the records. I said, you have so many records. You think they found that one sheet of paper that said you have food in the sinuses? Please go to my favorite gastroenterologist at Nashville and Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Michael Vasey. He was my associate at the Cleveland Clinic. We worked together. He believes that he should look carefully. He may not agree with me, but he will do the proper evaluation. She refluxes up into the back of her nose, standing upright, has no idea she's doing it. You have one index case like this. We have to then be hypervigilant and suspicious, uh, but it's a possibility. Anyway, so uh, flexible and rigid endoscopy are complementary. Um, the notion that rigid is so far superior and you shouldn't use a flexible should have long passed in our minds. With a flexible scope, we have an improved view of the operated upon sinuses. So in the post-operative patient, you know, these flexible scopes now go like 120 degrees back on itself. Um, and you can see the floor of the maxillary sinus. You look in there with a 30 degree scope with a nicely made antrostomy, you're not seeing the floor of that sinus. You're not seeing the anterior wall of that sinus. You're looking at the drainage outflow. You see a little bit of the orbital roof. You, if you have a large antrostomy, you can see the posterior floor of the sinus, but you're not seeing anteriorly. Meanwhile, the patient said, I saw color guest uh, drainage from my nose earlier today. And you look and you don't see anything. No, you're fine. And they leave. But if you look with a flexible scope as part of your routine exam in the post-operative patient and you use the scope to your physical advantage, looking around, you can actually see far more than what you would see with a 30 degree in your office or certainly a zero and even a 70. So every cart in my office is set up with a, 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 a flexible and a rigid scope. Um, I'm going to move on from that, uh, talking about the six tenets of nasal endoscopy. Uh, these are things that I think why we do it. Patient symptoms certainly can be an unreliable gauge of their disease. That discolored or opaque 
Discharge represents a pathological process. It doesn't say it's an organism. It's just not right. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard from practicing physicians, they have a little discolored drainage, so what? There's a snotty nose, particularly with kids. They all have that. That's not normal. That's not normal. Uh, but what it, you have to do about it is part of the balance and the struggle on what we do for quality of life. Uh, you don't have to pursue everything, but you should call it what it is. Don't say it's normal when it's abnormal. Um, endoscopy facilitates proper diagnosis. Uh, endoscopy is well tolerated. Endoscopic cultures may be helpful. I have some more data that suggests it's not as useful as I've pounded on the podium about for as long as I've said, but we're going to get there. Um, endoscopy make, uh, in most patients uh, with chronic uh, is most important in patients with chronic or refractory symptoms. Organisms also play an important role in inflammation. We know about the human microbiome, that the nose and the sinuses are not normally sterile. That was debated for a long time. There was one uh, doctor, a researcher in Baltimore, it's like Brooke, who's been saying for decades, not normal, not, not normally sterile, and everybody else says, oh, yes, in fact, especially the infectious disease community. Oh, they're sterile. The sinuses are sterile. Oh, oh never mind. Okay. Um, um, microbes disrupt uh, mucociliary clearance. Endoscopic cultures can help guide care. Altered biofilms are present in disease. Staph aureus is important with polyps but it's not in, in present in all polyps. Only about half of polyps, maybe a little less, are actually associated with eosinophilic disease and uh, staph aureus. So although there's a big push to make this the whole thing, Klaus Bockert from Belgium has done an enormous job in promoting this concept and understanding how significant um, staph aureus can be. And uh, it's been really important. And a long time ago, 99, uh, pretty long time ago, we demonstrated evidence of tissue involvement by the organism. So it's not just on the surface. Um, these organisms are well known to disrupt in vitro ciliary B frequency. These are common organisms uh, uh, to, in our sinusitis, and they may add to the problem with why inflammation settles in. Um, there is a new technology commercially available out there, not fully covered by insurance, which is part of uh, my dilemma in saying cultures, cultures, cultures. So testing the pus and evaluating it for DNA may be very important. Um, so I'm a longtime culturer. I have multiple papers on this. I have no commercial relationship with this company, um, and uh, I've barely had any contact with them other than to send our specimens. But um, here's a, a patient who uh, we grew a light growth of E. coli and cryptococcus. Um, white blood cells were seen, and there was rare gram-positive cocci on gram stain. So the organisms that grew out in semi-quantitative culture really uh, don't show up on gram stain. And one of the things about routine cultures is that the media and the microbiology lab and the infectious disease specialists have set it up so that the food on the Petri dish is to find a pathogen. Who made that choice? Which organism is a pathogen? Well, certainly things that are flesh-eating staff and things like that. But so there's a, there's a selection bias in the media of the Petri dish. And what this... DNA evaluation, which is now commercially available, does is it's like x-ray vision to see what critters are actually present. So this is E. coli that grew out in that semi-quantitative culture. And you can see it's somewhat resistant, and she has multiple drug sensitivities, which limits what I can do. But I'm thinking, I got to treat E. coli sinusitis here. I send it to the pathogenius. And they show us that um, the leading organisms in their level two testing is Prevotella and Fusobacterium in one specimen. And in uh, the other specimens, only 1% of the organisms in the DNA analysis was E. coli, which suggests that the food in the Petri dish 
overrepresented the importance of E. coli in treating this patient. Gradually, with anaerobic topical therapy, clindamycin rinses, she's gradually improved. It's taken a long, long time. So we're trying to get this work published right now. It's uh, um, meeting with resistance um, and to just report the comparison of the data between routine cultures and DNA analysis of the pus. Suffice it to say, <coughs> they don't always correlate. So I have 43 seconds left, and I'm sure I have a bucket of slides. I'm going to try and move a little bit further along. Uh, we talk about biofilms. We know that they can play a role. Polyps are associated with biofilms. Different biofilms are associated with varied severity of disease. Surgery has been shown to diminish biofilms. This, to me, is a macroscopic view of what I think a biofilm is. It's a hard crust stuck to the wall, and underneath it's pus. For a long time when I was a resident and years at, uh, from there, people would just say, oh, they have a little crusting in their nose. That's not normal. That's not a normal nose. That's not how a nose works. So uh, Staph aureus is associated with polyps, not all. Um, we, I talked about Bockert briefly. He suggested a super antigen as part of the histopathology. Um, time is up. Um, there is in situ hybridization technology, which we applied at Penn to our chronic sinusitis patients, and we found these black dots in situ uh, hybridization identified bacterial RNA in the sinus mucosa. And we don't know what organisms they were, but subsequently it's been seen to be staph, and even fungus has been shown. <clears throat> We know that topical irrigations matter. There have been some studies with uh, topical antimicrobial agents. When the concentration of the antibiotic rinse is so low, it's not effective, but it has been shown in isolated studies to have some benefit. For all procedures, preserve mu mu uh, mucosa and uh, remember Newton, uh, shave polyps as they are likely reservoir of staph or fungus, avoid stripping of uh, mucosa, uh, but bring down to a protective coating of the bone so you have less bone exposed. Remember, Newton and gravity always operate as posteriorly and inferiorly as practical. Um, remember your constant landmarks during surgery, the skull base, the medial and inferior orbit, the floor of the nasal cavity, the eustachian tube orifice, the roof of the posterior coena, all of these will orient you to where you are. You don't only need a middle turbinate, an uncinate. These are fixed areas inside the nose. Don't stay stuck with your endoscopic view. Bring your scope out, reorient yourself to height, look for these important structures. Five goals of surgery, what are they? <clears throat> for a long time we said in ventilation and drainage. It's not only ventilation and drainage. Particularly in chronic rhinosinusitis, you want to debreed, inflame tissues, possibly infected tissues, and maybe reduce leukotrienes. You might have improved diagnosis, and you'll have improved access for postoperative care with administering topical therapy. Regarding turbinate resection, so I think that turbinate resection along these blue lines is... Um, Okay, I think it's okay. Uh, and what I think is very important is to resect. Um, so the natural uh, opening of the maxillary sinus usually sits about here. And that's near the top front of the maxillary sinus. And taking the turbinate up just to the level of the top of the maxillary sinus allows the scope to go in the nose more readily while you're operating. And postoperatively, it's less likely to cause synechial dance. If you torque and twist the turbinate and make it all floppy, you're gonna have a mess and you're gonna hate that I even said this. But I find with very great care and using soft tissue shavers, uh, sharp turbinate scissors, that you can do some trimming with great benefit to the whole intraoperative and postoperative experience. And remember, this drawing is wrong. If it's in your office and you're using it, this drawing is wrong. If you want to write drawing, you can go to the prestigious Sniffle website. Never mind. 
All right, <clears throat> there are nine surgical indications. I'll try and wrap it up. I know that um, uh, over three minutes. Um, there's uh, nine indications. The only clear indications for any sinus surgery, absolutely clear, is for impending or actual complication to the lung, eye, or brain. Those are the like absolute in risks there. And if you think that there's a risk for those, then the patient should have surgery and should be told they should have surgery. But if they don't have that, they have a choice on quality of life, and the choice is completely theirs, and they should be educated about it. Symptomatic physical obstruction of the sinuses and nasal polyps, which cannot be alleviated medically, are also an indication, but it's not an absolute indication. Continuous... Maximal therapy is no longer improving symptoms. Patients are unable to tolerate maximal medical therapy for ongoing chronic sinus disease. Topical medical therapy within the sinuses will be Im perceived important to control disease and reduce the use of oral antib antibiotics and uh, oral steroids. Inspissated sinus debris is too hard for cilia to push out. These are reasons to try and ventilate and clear out the sinuses. And if sinus exploration is needed to aid in diagnosis, what if a, you, you know, I had a patient who was diagnosed by a physician for nine months with fungus-associated sinusitis and orbital loss at the floor, and the patient had uh, a spindle cell carcinoma of the orbit. The guy didn't want a biopsy because he had a little culture that grew aspergillus. Um, so there are... Um, Eliminate recirculation, so and also maybe to improve painfully disabling bouts of recurrent acute sinusitis. There's uh, issues on conformed consent. I'm now five minutes over. I'm really sorry, but these are very important, and I think uh, these will be made available to you in a handout form so that you can look at it. But the patient really should understand that blindness and CSF leak are a risk even though it's a benign and unlikely thing. I've had other colleagues who say, no, you don't need to tell them that. Uh, prominent rhinologists from in the country, I disagree. The patient's judgment will be jaded and they may not have surgery when they hear that information. But almost every year in my career, I've seen somebody with an orbital injury from somewhere else. So when that happens, you're in a bad situation if you've never discussed that with your patient. Um, Choose, uh, so uh, remember a stepwise approach, and then I'm summarized. <clears throat> Chronic rhinosinusitis is not the same. It may require continuous treatment. Recurring re acute rhinosinusitis has several causes, including this diagnosis that nobody's talking about of chronic nasopharyngitis. Flexible and rigid endoscopy are complementary. Organisms play an important role. And for procedures, preserve mucosa and remember Newton. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the honor, the invitation to come to present and share my work. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Lanza. Uh, do we have a question for Dr. Lanza while the next group of speakers is coming up? Uh, Dr. Batra, as well as Dr. Mo, and Dr. Lanza. Short trip over to the chair. If you oh, OK, mind. the chair. I'm going to the chair. Going to the chair. Yeah. Didn't have time to elaborate on that. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so it's a great question. Um, uh, I'm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I try and use mostly topical therapy. In the very beginning, I may use systemic steroids and or a culture directed or DNA-directed antimicrobial therapy to reduce the severity of the localized inflammation. And then after a period of time, usually about a month, I will resort mostly to topical therapy to prevent it from reforming. But I don't think that stripping the mucosa on the skull base in that patient's nose is going to help me cure the problem. So I see it as a superficial biofilm microbe type issue, and it just needs continuous care. Um, the patient may come back intermittently. I have used topical um, gel foam soaked um, antimicrobials 
in sinuses where it won't fall out and choke the patient. On that patient, it's up on the skull base, it won't sit, but I have seen some uh, benefit by using that to clear up the stuff that just doesn't want to come away. I have no uh, series, this is just anecdote, I have no series to report its effectiveness, uh, but I have used it as a topical care in the office. There's no specific CPT code charge or benefit to me. It's a big waste of time, but I do it because I find that patients benefit from it. I will put gel foam, gentamicin soaked material into a sinus and see them back a week or two later and repeat it until the volume of that crusting subsides. So, and Ernie, how, what, what would you do in that situation? <clears throat> So I don't have that magic potion, uh, the gel foam, genomycin, or uh, uh, antimicrobial, uh, other antimicrobial agent are the things that I'm using. Um, I, I have tried the Manuka honey. I have tried this uh, soap. Uh, I, I'm not impressed, really. I now know that there's some sort of benefit, and patients like to think they're using something uh, like natural or safe. Uh, uh, but, you know, Socrates killed himself with hemlock. Uh, 